How long would a clock continue working in a crocodile? For a zombie outbreak to be a legitimate threat, how contagious would the virus need to be? We obviously use more than 10% of our brain. Where did that idea come from? So, some spiders have a working memory. Could we teach them the spell? You're listening to Device, your monthly book club with a science-based twist. In each episode, we discuss a story that uses a natural phenomenon to drive the action of the plot and dissect it for scientific accuracy. I am your host, Emily T. Griffiths, and in this episode, we are going to be diving into the novel behind the great thriller, Jaws, by Peter Benchley. At its heart, Jaws is a story about a massive shark that moved unexpectedly into waters off a little coastal town called Amity. That simple idea has struck fear into beachgoers for more than 40 years. The novel Jaws was a best-selling summer read. Its success surprised even Benchley himself. I didn't think anyone would want to read a story about a fish. But oh, how we did. We're going to talk about that fish and how Jaws tapped into something which enabled us to villainize an endangered species. Device is supported by The Book Catapult, an independent bookstore located in the heart of South Park. The Book Catapult specializes in literary fiction, children's picture books, narrative nonfiction, and all of the books you didn't know you needed until you walked through the door. The Book Catapult is a haven for those seeking a community connection through the world of books in our fast-paced, increasingly digital society. Let The Book Catapult put a real book in your hand. More at thebookcatapult.com. Welcome back. You're listening to Device, and we're discussing Jaws by Peter Benchley. In this series, we're generally going to avoid talking about films. But in the case of Jaws, we're not simply talking about a film adaptation. We're talking about the first blockbuster that changed how cinema spoke to an audience. It's still considered one of the best American films ever made. There are some major differences between the novel and the film. Chief Brody is a local and has a stressed marriage. Quint barely shows up until the last third of the book and doesn't help pass the time with well-told war stories. There is an entire subplot about the mayor's relationship with the mafia, which is the real reason he doesn't want to close the beaches. But I think the biggest difference is with Hooper. In the novel, Hooper is an obnoxious egomaniac rather than a lovable goof. I don't have to take this abuse much longer. But he's also, as the marine biologist, the device both Benchley and the film used to give us shark facts. And Benchley's Hooper was a better scientist. Sharks, they have everything a scientist dreams of. They're beautiful. God, how beautiful they are. They're like an impossibly perfect piece of machinery. They're as graceful as any bird, and they're as mysterious as any animal on Earth. And no one knows for sure exactly how long they'll live or what impulses, except for hunger, they respond to. The first scene of the novel is as memorable and thrilling as the start of the film. Young Chrissy Watkins is skinny dipping at night. But the story starts from the perspective of the fish. The great fish moved silently through the water, propelled by short sweeps of its crescent tail. The mouth was open just enough to permit a rush of water over the gills. There was little other motion, an occasional correction of the apparently aimless course by the slight raising or lowering of a pectoral fin as a bird changes direction by dipping one wing and lifting the other. The eyes were senseless in the black, and the other senses transmitted nothing extraordinary to the small, primitive brain. It only survived by moving. He shows us the fish underwater while we, the reader, know that Chrissy Watkins is at the surface, and it's only a matter of time before they become part of the same story. A hundred yards offshore, the fish sensed a change in the sea's rhythm. It did not see the woman, nor yet did it smell her. Running within the length of its body were a series of thin canals filled with mucus and dotted with nerve endings. And these nerves detected vibrations and signaled to the brain. The fish turned to shore. You know, initially it smelled. This is Dr. Heidi Dewar, 
from the National Marine Fisheries Service based in La Jolla. I work in the Life History Program, and our group is responsible for collecting the biological data that supports sustainable management of fish like um, tuna or sharks or billfish, which would include swordfish. She is the lead author of the status report on the northeast population of white sharks. They have excellent um, olfactory senses, so they're really good smellers. Then they also have the lateral line, which are all these, and he explained that really well, actually, which I was like, oh. Those mucus-filled canals. Which allows them to de- detect vibrations. Yeah, I thought he did a, um, a good job of, of sort of capturing the biology in, that, in those moments. So shark perspective is okay. But that isn't what's scary about Jaws. The three main features of the Jaws shark is that it, A, has developed a taste for human flesh, B, is massive, and C, sticks around one area hunting. So let's break it down. First, are we even a good food source for white sharks? Um, Well, their diets actually change with ontogeny or development, like smaller white sharks um, until maybe you know, eight or nine feet would feed mostly on like fish or sharks, skates, rays. And then when they get to be about that size, then their diet shifts. And interestingly, their teeth morphology also shifts. Um, And they start feeding on marine mammals. So they would eat seals, sea lions, or um, feed on dead whale, floating whale carcasses, which sounds very gross and is, but good food source. And we're pretty bony. By comparison. We're, yeah, for the most part, we are pretty bony and, and definitely don't have, you know, the same amount of fat as like a marine mammal would. Bluntly put, we're not good food. Sharks bite us to taste us. And when they find out we're not what they want, they spit us out. That's why most people survive shark bites. Well, that and the miracle of readily available modern medicine. Next. One of the most intimidating aspects of the Jaws shark is its size. 20 feet is massive, about half the size of a telephone pole. The film even bumps that number up to 25 feet. And to me, that just feels cartoonishly large. But if you look into San Diego's own history with shark interactions, one 20-foot story does come up. Since the 1930s, there have only been 37 shark incidents in San Diego County. 14 of them have been white sharks, and only two have been fatal. The first documented fatal shark bite in San Diego was in 1959. Robert Pamperin was abalone fishing with his friend Gerald Leher at Alligator Head near the west end of La Jolla Cove. They were separated by about 30 meters when Bob Pamperin called out for help. Oh, oh. Lara recalls seeing his friend lift abnormally out of the water before disappearing below the waves. He dove down to help, thinking Bob had a cramp. What he saw instead was chilling. Lara reported that Bob was in the mouth of a 20-foot shark. He described the triangular teeth and dark gray back of a white shark near the sandy bottom. After grabbing another breath, Lara dove back into the water and tried to scare the shark away by frantically waving his hands, but it was no use. Succumbing to shock, Lara made his way back towards the shore. That's a scary story, but it's still just one of two times out of 37 in the past 80 years. Since only one man saw that 20-foot shark, How likely is it that the shark was actually that size? Well, the maximum, I mean, you read all sorts of reports in the literature, but the one that's really been validated is about 21 feet for um, the largest shark. Okay, but that's the max. What's the average size? You know, it would be like asking what's the average size of a human being. Well, you have little kid human beings and you have adult human beings and creating one average from all of that, you know, it's not sure how much information that provides. The average size of a white shark depends on how it's using its habitat. As it turns out, most of the sharks off our coasts are basically little kids. From point conception down, Southern California and Baja is a really important nursery area. Our waters are a source of food, 
protection, and resources which support a healthy ecosystem. Because of that, it's a foraging ground for a ton of different species, from swordfish to squid to marine mammals and, of course, the sharks. On an average day, a white shark found along our coastline isn't going to be a 20-footer. It's going to be 10 or 12 feet until they reach maturity, and then they're going to head further offshore. Lastly, and perhaps the most persistent fear Jaws made popular, is the concept of a rogue shark. A shark that not only has developed a taste for human flesh, it hangs around human-populated beaches for food. Hooper, in the film, suggests Jaws is a rogue shark. It's just a theory that I happen to agree with. But Hooper in the book knows better. Rogue sharks are myths. As Dr. Dewar said before, sharks don't specifically hunt for humans. Sometimes we're just in the wrong place. It, it was upsetting to Peter because what he was trying to say is that these are great white sharks. These are un- unbelievable, magnificent apex predators in the ocean. And they are just doing what they do. More on that from our next guest after the break. This KPBS podcast is supported by Rogers Behavioral Health, offering children, teens, and adults in the San Diego area treatment for OCD, anxiety, depression, and other mental health disorders. Now accepting admissions. Information at rogersbh.org. Additional support comes from listeners like you. Welcome back. You're listening to Device, and this month we are talking about Jaws by Peter Benchley and the myths surrounding white sharks. The film Jaws relies heavily on the rogue shark theory, that a shark will hang around a human-populated beach hunting those foolish enough to go into the water. The novel certainly borrows from that idea, but it never suggests that the shark is malicious. Look, Chief, you can't go off half-cocked looking for vengeance against a fish. The shark isn't evil. It's not a murderer. It's just obeying its own instincts. Trying to get retribution against a fish is just crazy. Yet we see a lot of headlines that use the phrase rogue shark or manhunter. It's eye-catching. In 2010, it was reported that a rogue shark bit five people with one fatality in Shrem el Shrank, Egypt. But the articles describe how a livestock ship was tossing sheep overboard as they perished, crossing the Red Sea. Multiple sharks followed the discarded carcasses to shore, looking for more free food. In every situation of multiple shark bites in one area, if you keep reading, you'll find it couldn't be just one rogue shark. When Peter was researching Jaws, he read everything he could get his hands on about the, the, quote, rogue shark phenomenon. Unfortunately, Peter Benchley died in 2006. You know, Emily, thank you very much for asking me to do um, this podcast. This is Wendy Benchley, Peter's wife. Yeah, I'm, I'm really delighted to um, be talking with you and... Based in Washington, D.C., Wendy is a powerhouse for shark conservation and actively engaging with the marine policy community. She speaks with people around the world addressing shark myths, like rogue sharks. Because it had been debunked by really good scientists. Benchley himself told the Daily Express, Knowing what I know now, I could never write that book today. Sharks don't target human beings, and they certainly don't hold grudges. Benchley is unique in this. There aren't a lot of authors that would openly regret their claim to fame. But he saw how the public feared and misunderstood sharks. Furthermore, he saw how that fear was hurting shark populations. Sharks, in general, aren't doing so good. So he tried to flip the script. He went on to write two books about how shark conservation matters. He and Wendy started doing appearances. And Wendy continues that work. Um, I... I've been a lucky soul all my life because uh, I've been involved in many nonprofit groups, the Environmental Defense Fund and Wild Aid and Ocean Conservancy and others that have done a lot of ocean work. So what's the greatest threat shark populations are facing today? Oh, I, I think it's certainly the shark thinning that goes on for shark fin soup. And... Um, 
that that has been just devastating to the shark population. Shark fin soup is a delicacy in many Asian countries, but mostly China. It costs upwards of 150 U.S. dollars per bowl. It is made by cooking a dried shark fin, which is mostly cartilage, in broth. Apparently, it has a nice texture. It's a status symbol and thought to have medicinal benefits. Oh, shark finning is just an odious, uh, odious practice where sharks are caught, and while they're still alive, their fins are hacked off with knives, and then in most cases, the sharks are thrown back into the water to die a slow, suffocating death. And it's just astonishing when you think that there are, well, at least 70 million sharks that are caught and finned this way. That's 70 million a year. And sharks can't reproduce fast enough to adequately replace themselves. We're hunting them out of existence. Shark finning is a pretty lucrative practice, retailing at 400 US dollars per kilogram dried. A single fin from a protected species like a whale or a white shark can fetch 10,000 US dollars. So, what's there to do? Regulations help, but they don't stop the demand for the supply. It's about changing the public's perception. I've worked for many years with Wild Aid, which is an organization that's based in San Francisco, and they have just done a spectacular job uh, using Asian icons like Jackie Chan and Yao Ming to do very professional, absolutely brilliant um, public service announcements that have saturated China and other Asian countries. So this campaign has been very successful and the demand for shark fin soup has gone down in China by 80 percent since 2014. So the, the hope is that there will be less sharks caught and killed this way as the years go along. Public awareness is key to solving a lot of conservation issues. Outside of shark fin soup, shark liver oil and cartilage are sold as health supplements. You know, medicinal benefits. Manufacturers claim that sharks don't get cancer and that by ingesting shark supplements, you can reduce your risk of cancer or even treat cancer while boosting your immune system. And the fact is, sharks are very good healers. Um, and they do have extraordinarily strong immune systems. But this, but, but this is on a molecular level. And um, by just ingesting shark oil, you're not going to get that kind of benefit um, from the shark oil. Or any shark product. There is absolutely no reproducible medical evidence that shark products help with any ailment. Period. That so many supplements are are promoted by by companies, and there's been no testing at all. And certainly that's the case with shark oil. So I hope people just will not fall for this by nothing to do with um, shark cartilage or shark oil. And certainly, please, 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 don't have shark fin soup. Different protections and regulations came into effect in the 90s, when shark populations hit a record low. And shark finning has been banned in the U.S. since 2000. The protections have made North America one of the last shark refuges. And it's worth highlighting that U.S. fisheries are getting better at being sustainable, especially on the West Coast. There are better protections on gear to prevent bycatch. Current longline fisheries, like the current longlines are not your grandfather's longlines. Dr. Dewar, again. They've made a tremendous amount of advancements, and there's more work that needs to be done. And that's our responsibility is to try to balance utilizing a resource but doing it sustainably. Like in San Diego, our whole fishing community has been revitalized by like the dockside market and... You know, the direct marketing from the boats straight to consumers and the chefs are totally into it. And, you know, so it's, we can do it. It's challenging. Um, But I think that, you know, in the end, if we do it sustainably, that's, that's the end goal. There are still some management challenges with white sharks and open ocean fishing gear. But 
some shark populations are starting to grow again. That's encouraging. It means we're doing something right. When writing this episode, everyone I mentioned it to had a story about how scared they were when they first saw Jaws. How they wouldn't swim in lakes or swimming pools. How it ruined a family vacation. Or how it inspired them to learn more about marine biology. Because of this book, we have a cultural connection to white sharks. It's why we call them great. What makes Jaws such a timeless thriller is how close it sits to the truth. Today, we are bombarded by silly parodies like Sharknado and any one of numerous takes on how Megalodon, a more than twice as large prehistoric ancestor to the Great White, may still be lurking in the deep ocean. Speaking of prehistoric creature features, where's the Placoderm movie, huh? We know these movies are silly, though. That's part of the fun. Jaws is scary because it's based in the almost true. Sharks can be 20 feet long, even if it's unlikely to see one that size near the shore. And sometimes, they do bite people. It doesn't matter that you're far more likely to be bitten by a shark and left alone to survive, or really, not to be bitten at all. There's still that fear, and that fear creates prejudice. Benjamin knew that fear existed. After Chrissy Watkins is found, Chief Brody is talking to newspaper editor Harry Meadows, who has a much more influential role in the novel than the film. Meadows, concerned about tourism, says, If I run a story saying that a young woman was bitten in two by a monster shark off Amity, there won't be another house rented in this town. Sharks are like axe murders, Martin. People react to them with their guts. There's something crazy and evil and uncontrollable about them. Or at least, that's the perception sharks just can't seem to shake. So what can we do about it? Well, we can change how we talk about sharks. I think that newspapers and magazines and people who talk about sharks should talk about a shark bite, not a shark attack. In so many cases, uh, when a shark bites a human, it is just that, a bite, he goes away and does not come back. Changing the language that we use to talk about sharks matters. Shark attack has a negative connotation. If you're being attacked, then you need to be on the defensive. Shark bite better describes what's really going on. And, and do remember that if there are more shark bites nowadays, that there are so many more millions of people in the ocean swimming. When you think about it, 100 years ago or 150 years ago, <laughs> There was, I mean, swimming was just not what it is now. Yeah. Um, so now we have millions of people in the ocean, enjoying the ocean as they could and should, but we do have to have respect. The risk of being bitten is still far, really, really, really small. But, at the, you know, at the same time, there is a risk, and you know the one of the most amazing things about living here is that you can walk down to the the beach and like dip your feet in wilderness, like that is wilderness, you know, and that's amazing to be able to wade into wilderness at our doorstep. But wilderness comes with wild animals, and sharks are wild animals. So let's follow Benchley's example and help keep them there. Device is co-produced by myself and Derek Acosta. It is recorded at KPBS and Mega64 Studios in San Diego, California. John Wanzer is our audio engineer with additional music by the Bicycats. Voice actors for this episode include Mark Atkinson, Aaron Gold, and Anthony Mays. At KPBS, Emily Jankowski is technical director, Kinsey Moreland is podcast coordinator, Lisa Jane Morset is operations manager, and John Decker is Director of Programming. You can get our monthly episodes of Device on your preferred podcast app. There was so much information that we had to cut out from this episode. I kept Dr. Heidi Dewar and Wendy Benchley chatting for nearly an hour apiece. Heidi and I talked a lot more about sharks and what's going on with the Northeast population. Wendy had so many amazing firsthand stories about making Jaws and her and Peter's crusade for shark conservation. 
And when the shark came up again and opened her, opened her mouth to take another bite, I grabbed the rope and yanked as hard as I could and pulled it out of her mouth. Please do yourself a favor and go and listen to the full interviews on device interviews wherever you get your podcasts. You will learn cool things, I promise. Next episode, we'll be discussing Life as We Knew It by Susan Beth Pfeffer. So get reading. Devices made possible by the KPBS Explore program because science is at the heart of every exploration. And the best stories take us somewhere worth going. Thanks for listening. I'm Beth Accomando. If you need a film fix, want to hear what filmmakers have to say about their work, or just want to know what's worth seeing this weekend, then subscribe to the KPBS Cinema Junkie podcast by going to kpbs.org slash cinemajunkie.